is now lost forever. There was a time when the land was sacred, and the ancient ones were as one with it. A time when only the children of the Great Spirit were here. To light their fires in these places with no boundaries. When the forests were as thick as the fur of the winter bear. When a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. In that time when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart the conflicts to come. And whether it was to be for good or bad, what was certain was that there would be change. Popular myth has a tendency to focus on what the men of the West were, leaving the impression that women were just their servants. No doubt, when the first wagon trains left, some women were reluctant to leave their comfortable homes for the almost certain hardships of the trail. But undoubtedly, the same was true for some men. The reality was, it didn't take long for Western fever to infect everyone with the same lust for adventure and freedom. My husband was fired with patriotism, and I was possessed with a spirit of adventure and a desire to see what was new and strange. We had become indifferent to fear, and we felt sure we could go almost anywhere. Miriam Thompson Tuller, emigrate to Oregon, 1845. The women in the West uh, were, just like the men, entrepreneurial, courageous, bold, adventurous, intelligent. The West really selected and filtered people the women had to be all those things the men were in spades because they were doing all the same things the men were doing and lacking the same degree of physical prowess uh, that the men had. And the women in the West were the very uh, best that America had to offer. In an era when the ideal notion for womanhood was all ruffles and domesticity, the migration West created challenging new roles for women that only the courageous dared to fill. While writers and artists were romanticizing the West as a man's frontier, pioneer women were busy making their own version of history. In reading the diaries of women who went West, you find uh, women who looked upon this as a great adventure of their lives. That many other women are not going to experience this, and that we should appreciate it even though it's uncomfortable. Nearly everybody had what was called the gold fever, my husband with the rest. I said, we were married to live together, he's saying, yes. And I am willing to go with you to any part of God's footstool where you think you can do the best. And so it was settled that we should go next year to the California gold mines. Mary Jane Hayden, 1849. There's an indication that only 10% of the people going west in the gold rush days of 49 uh, were women. Only one out of 10 were women within 10 years they, it was about half and half because women knew the men weren't going to come back for a long time and the men knew they weren't coming back. They wanted the women to go with them. The West in the early days was an area of single men. There were soldiers, there were cowboys, there were miners. The idea was if you wanted to find a husband, you could go to a place where there was a male surplus. So for some women, it was a chance to have a better, a better chance on the marriage market. For other women, there were entrepreneurial opportunities, business opportunities, and some people simply were dragged, kicking and screaming out to the West, and once they got here, many hated it and others loved it. The long-suffering pioneer wife sitting passively under a sunbonnet upon her husband's wagon was a common stereotype. But the frontier called out to women from all races, classes, and creed. We have to remember that there's a, a, a variation of women who went West. 
Most of them, of course, went with their husbands, but you had very uh, well-educated wives of officers in the army. You had women who were going to be nurses. They might be going out there to help educate the Indians. And then you had the uh, adventurous woman, uh, the fancy woman, the Galago Gap, who went out to make a fortune. So you can't pin down a Western woman as being a sun-bonneted wife sitting on a covered wagon and heading west. The myth of the woman sitting on the buckboard of the covered wagon is just that, because they walked. You walk to save the animals, you walk because you're trying to carry your stuff. But all along the way, they're gathering dry buffalo chips to use for fuel, and then you have to convince your family that the food tastes good once you're cooking with buffalo. Dunk. It rains and snows. I carry my babe and lead, or rather carry another, through snow, mud, and water almost to my knees. It is the worst road. Sometimes I have to place my babe on the ground and help to keep the wagon from turning over. Elizabeth Smith Gear, 1847. Imagine having to take your kitchen on the road, having to uh, take care of your children on the road, having to make shelter. Well, they had to clean, they had to wash clothes, they had to uh, prepare food, uh, take care of the children. It was a, a 24 hour day. Women also faced another special hardship on the trail. About one out of every five who made the overland journey was pregnant. All too often, pioneer mothers had to watch their children die. The mothers had the families directly in their hands and were with them all the time, especially during sickness. I remember distinctly one girl in particular, about my own age, that died and was buried on the road. Her mother had a great deal of trouble and suffering. It strikes me as I think of it now that mothers on the road had to undergo more trial and suffering than anybody else. Martha Ann Morrison, 1844. The losses of loved ones, the injuries uh, suffered in these treks, the daily routine often was a monumental task just to survive. The Trans-Mississippi West is really our Homeric epic. It's our era of heroes, um, male and female. Being forced to conquer these hardships of daily life gave women newly found confidence and a taste of independence that they weren't in a hurry to give up as the end of the trail drew near. Women's roles had been established for centuries as to what part they played in. This was going to change. This was going to change in the West. The West was a new world where old rules and customs could be reshaped or just tossed to the wind. Some daring and clever women saw the new frontier as a chance to break free of the traditional roles that had held them back for so long. I was considered a remarkable good shot and a fearless rider for a girl of my age. I was christened Calamity Jane. Martha Canary Burke, 1896. Who was Calamity Jane is one of your uh, $5 million questions in Western history and Western women's history. And she told so many stories about herself, invented such a life for herself, all of it based a little bit on fact, that it's almost impossible to say for sure what is and what isn't about Calamity Jane. My maiden name was Martha Canary. As a child, I always had a fondness for adventure and outdoor exercise. What we know about Calamity Jane is that it seems she was born in Missouri, Princeton, Missouri, in the 1850s sometime, that she made her way with her family out to Montana as a teenage, young teenage girl. While on the way, the greater part of my time was spent hunting along with the man hunters of the party. In fact, I was at all times with the men when there was adventure and excitement to be had. They finally end up in Virginia City. Calamity Jane was uh, associating with these miners and rough cut people. She hung around the saloons. She went as a, as a girl, I understand. She would, she'd go down, she'd pass the saloon, she'd stand at the door and peek in. Sometime in the late 1860s, Calamity Jane's parents died, leaving a teenage girl to fend for herself in one of the roughest regions of the frontier. It appears that she had to be on her own 
for a long time and to be a woman adrift in that sense and, or a young girl adrift and have to make your way. I think that it took a certain detachment from caring about what anybody thought. These women essentially had very few options. There were very few professions for a woman to enter outside of nursing and, uh, and school teaching. Lacking formal education, Martha Cannery's solution was to defy the boundaries of convention and tackle the man's frontier like a man. Her features were rough enough that she could pass as a man, and so she could do man's work and be paid for man's work. I met her in 79. I said, who is that loudmouth man? And the boss said, that ain't no man. That's Calamity Jane, a Black Hills pioneer. She could drink, she could shoot, she could gamble, she could ride. Um, could drive a team of horses and a freight wagon. Uh, could scout, could track, could do all of those things. There's no question about that. And that part of the legend seems uh, fully substantiated by the facts. Cannery was always on the move, from Montana to Arizona to Kansas, and any place in between where she could find a warm bed and some cold booze. She worked as a bullwhacker, a stagecoach driver, and even as a military scout, where according to her so-called autobiography, she earned her famous nickname. It was on Goose Creek, Wyoming. We were ambushed about a mile and a half from our destination. I saw the captain reeling in his saddle as though about to fall. I turned my horse and got there in time to catch him as he was falling. Captain Egan, upon recovering, laughingly said, I name you Calamity Jane, the heroine of the plains. But Calamity's accounts of her army career, like many of her stories, are subject to suspicion. I joined General Custer and headed for the Indian campaigns. She almost certainly did not work for Custer during that Black Hills expedition because she was spotted by no less than Buffalo Bill uh, down in the Bighorns and during that same summer of 1874 guiding a party of gold hunters. Uh, but she did ride with uh, a detachment of the cavalry in, in, in 1875. She doesn't appear on any of the army rolls because um, she was hired either irregularly or under an assumed name. Buffalo Bill says she was never hired until the, the uh, detachment was far enough away from base that uh, it was too late to send her back. In the late 1870s, Calamity's wanderings led her to Deadwood, South Dakota. Deadwood was a place where a lot of disputes were settled by shooting it out. It was a very highly transient population. It was in 1876 in the Deadwood Saloon that Wild Bill Hickok was gunned down by Jack McCall. And it may have been in such a saloon that the famous rumor about Wild Bill and Calamity Jane began to spread. Calamity Jane said that she and Wild Bill Hickok were lovers. This was the great love of her life, and she was the great love of his life. Uh, Calamity Jane undoubtedly knew Wild Bill Hickok, and Wild Bill Hickok undoubtedly knew her. In fact, some of Hickok's friends said she used to come by and drink their liquor. But they were not friends. At least Hickok didn't consider them to be friends. Um, he kept his distance from her. I, I think there's a certain amount of self-delusion. Calamity Jane must have been the kind of person who wanted so desperately to live the life that she invented for herself that she came to believe it. Nearly 40 years after Calamity Jane's death, a woman came forward in Montana claiming to be the daughter of Calamity and Wild Bill, and she offered letters, even a marriage certificate, as her proof. The story at the time was that Calamity Jane had actually married a brother or a cousin of Wild Bill Hickox with the same name, James Butler Hickox. Um, there was a furor. The woman disappeared. The letters disappeared. She surfaced again later with letters that showed that no, uh, Calamity this time had married Wild Bill Hickox uh, and that this woman was the, uh, the issue of that marriage. None of those things check out. In her 1896 autobiography, Jane names another man, Clinton Burke, as her husband, and as the father of a daughter whom historians have never been able to track down. He didn't stick around very long. The, um, the marriage gave her his last name and very little else. Alone again, Jane was faced with survival and headed east to try and cash in on her dying novel fame. 
that, for whatever reason, wasn't right for her. She may even have sensed how demeaning it was to be a zoo animal. And when Buffalo Bill was in town that summer, she asked him if he would help her get home. And they gave her the money to go back to Montana, probably the last he heard of her until she died. She died of some disease or organ failure brought on by years and years and years of abusing her system through drinking too much and carousing, whether it's inflammation of the bowels or kidney failure or, or a heart attack. She died in August of 1903. But Calamity didn't die alone. Beloved by the citizens of Deadwood for her generous heart and loving nature, she was given a hero's funeral and granted her last wish to be laid to rest next to Wild Bill Hickok. She was outstanding, that woman was. It was down in her heart, and if she had a chance to do sucker for somebody and help them out of a tight place, so she was right there. But then, you know, she would go to these body houses and dance halls, and it was whoopee, and soon she was drunk, and then, well, things just sort of went haywire for old calamity. Charlie Hawks, Deadwood resident. She was a heroic figure in Deadwood. There was a smallpox epidemic. And she helped to nurse many and afflicted a smallpox victim back to health. Her heroic work during the smallpox epidemic really helped make her a legend. She really was apparently the kind of person who would, who would give you the, um, the last penny in her pocket. And everyone seemed to like her. They might not approve of her, but they couldn't dislike her. The final irony is that when she died on August 1st, 1903, she was buried with a gravestone that says August 2nd, because that was the anniversary of Wild Bill Hickok's death. So what's real and what's not, it's very difficult to say. I think we're fascinated with wild women of the West, in part because we also have a new genre of literature, the dime novel, growing up, and that we had wild men of the West, people like Bill Hickok and Buffalo Bill and the various desperados, uh, and that once you kind of used up that genre, you were looking for a wild woman to maybe write a new twist into the story, a new plot twist. Of all the noted women ever mentioned by word or pen, none in history have been more brilliantly daring than Belle Starr, champion and leader of robbers, herself a sure shot and a murderess, who was a terror alike to those she hated and to false friends. Alton B. Myers, writing in the employment of publisher Richard K. Fox, 1889. It all began with a reporter for the National Place Gazette who was sitting on the streets of Fort Smith, Arkansas, when the news broke that Belle Star had been killed at Younger Bend. Well, Belle Star, the bandit queen, I mean, that just rolled through his head, and held by August, he had this novel. She never robbed a stagecoach in her life. She never rode at the head of a bandit gang. It's all pure fiction. I mean, as far as a woman, there's, there's nothing attached to her in history at all. Who really was Belle Star? Was she the deadly outlaw queen of dime novel fame? A just an unlucky woman, guilty by her association with some of the most notorious criminals of the day. Her legend begins in Jasper County, Missouri, in a genteel Southern family just before the Civil War. Myra Bell Shirley, that was her, her name originally. She was raised properly in Carthage, Missouri, and went to a female academy. Uh, educated in the classics, played the piano, so she was a proper young woman until the Civil War erupted. At the outbreak of the war, Missouri was a state divided. Groups of vigilante bushwhackers like William Clark Quantrill and his Confederate guerrillas roamed the countryside, harassing the Yankees and violently defending their homeland. One such vigilante was 22-year-old Bud Shirley, Myra's beloved older brother. In June of 1864, Bud's short life came to an end with a shot in the back from a Union soldier's rifle. When 16-year-old Myra Bell came to claim the body, the legends about her began. Myra Shirley appeared with a belt around her waist from which swung two big revolvers, one on each side. She was not timid in making it known among those she saw that she meant to get revenge for her brother's death. Miss Sarah Musgrave, witness. The fact that her brother was killed by Union soldiers who she hated, this, this probably was in her system all her life. 
She found herself, first of all, trying to be a kind of spy and to carry Confederate secrets back and forth to the various guerrilla gangs who were operating in the south, what was then the southwestern part of the United States and in the Indian Territory. As the war came to an end, the Shirley's were burned out of their home and fled to Dallas to start a new life. Meanwhile, many of their Confederate guerrilla friends were becoming full-fledged outlaws, like Frank and Jesse James and Cole Younger and his brothers, who sometimes sought shelter at Bell's father's farm. Young Jim Reed, another of Quantrill's guerrillas and Bell's childhood sweetheart, was already at odds with the law when he married Bell in 1866. The thing about Jim Reed, uh, after they married, he still had his old guerrilla ways, the things he'd learned riding with Quantrill. He never broke away from it. Jim Reed was hardly a model husband and father for Belle and their two children, Pearl and Eddie. He had a gambling habit, chased other women, and took part in a number of high-profile crimes. Last night about dusk, the state bringing the United States mails and 11 passengers were stopped by three armed men who cut the front horses out, made the passengers get out, and took all their money and jewelry. Dallas Daily Commercial, April 10, 1874. The dying novelist cast Bell as a participant in these famous heists. Bell was not involved in this. She was still at home with her parents, uh, with her two children. Jim continued on with his spree. The warrants were still for him. Uh, he was finally captured and uh, near Paris, Texas, and, and killed by a deputy sheriff. After the death of Reed, according to the fictions, she was supposed to have been playing the piano and saloon and writing songs and kicking up her heels around Dallas. Contrary to the myths, Belle and her children were left destitute after Reed's death. In June of 1880, Belle married her second outlaw, Sam Starr, a Cherokee Indian from a family of horse thieves, cattle rustlers, and whiskey peddlers, brought his new wife and her children deep into the Indian Territory to Younger's Bend, a secluded spot on the Canadian River with a reputation as a hideout for fugitives. As long as Belle lived with him with the Cherokee, she could live in the Indian nation with her children. Otherwise, she would, could have been thrown out. So she stuck with Sam regardless of what kind of rag it was, I think. On the Canadian River, far from society, I hoped to pass the remainder of my days in peace. But it soon became noised around that I was a woman of some notoriety from Texas. And from that time on, my actions have been severely criticized. My home became famous as an outlaw's ranch long before I was visited by any of the boys who were friends of mine. Jesse James first came in and stayed several weeks. Bell Star, 1888. Bell's soft spot for outlaws like Blue Duck, a convicted murderer, contributed to her bad reputation. Rumors spread that she helped fugitives escape to nearby Robbers Cave. But aside from playing hostess to the occasional desperado, Bell herself stayed out of trouble until 1882, when she and Sam were arrested for stealing a neighbor's horses. The very idea of a woman being charged with an offense of this kind was sufficient to fill the courtroom with spectators. While she could not be considered even a good-looking woman, her appearances of that kind as would be sure to attract the attention of wild and desperate characters. Fort Smith, New Era, February 22, 1883. Bell and Sam pleaded innocent, claiming that Sam had the measles when the horses were stolen. The jury didn't believe. Isaac C. Parker, the hanging judge, sealed their fate. Both Bell and Sam were sentenced to nine months at the House of Correction in Detroit. Pearl, my dear little one, I shall be away from you for a few months, baby, and have only this consolation to offer you that never again will I be placed in such humiliating circumstances. It won't take long for time to glide by, and as we come home, we will get you, and then we will have such a nice time. Bye-bye, sweet baby mine. Bell Star, 1883. Six months later, the stars returned home. Bell wanted to clean up their reputation, but outlaws kept on dropping by, and Sam kept on getting into trouble with the law. He was shot to death in a duel with his nemesis, the Indian policeman, Frank West. Widowed again, Bell and the now teenage Pearl and Eddie faced eviction from their home in the Cherokee Nation. 
So she turns around and uh, moves in with Jim July, moves Jim July in with her, who was another Cherokee. Uh, Jim July was a fugitive himself. Bell tried to keep her new husband out of trouble while she vowed that no more outlaws would be welcomed at Younger's Bend. She had leased part of her land there on the Canadian to a fellow named Edgar Watson. Uh, Watson's wife and Bell were very good friends, and in their chit chat, Watson's wife revealed that her husband was wanted for murder in Florida, and that he was a fugitive from justice. This stirred Bell up considerably. Bell told Watson to pack up and get out of Younger's Bend, and he refused. And she says, Okay, maybe the marshals would like to know that you're wanted for murder in Florida. And this probably was what she should have said. On a brisk February morning, Bell rode partway to Fort Smith with Jim July, who was heading to a court hearing. Then she started home, alone. As she rode on towards the crossing of the Canadian River, that there was a man standing in the corner of the fence, and as she passed by, he let her have it with a loaded buckshot. And then he walked up to her after she lay on the ground in the mud and fired a loaded turkey shot. In the face. The tracks and everything in the, cor in the corner of the fence all went to Watson's home. They were single footprints and they arrested Watson. They couldn't find enough against him to bind him over for trial. They buried Bell Star on the land she had struggled and died for. But while the woman was gone, the legend was just beginning. Well, she never was a wild woman, except in the imagination of the dime novelist that, that originated it. She was a survivor. She had to be. She survived the war. She survived three outlaw husbands. She, she had to be a survivor. He even survived uh, everything except the uh, two loads of buckshot that killed her. It was considered almost shameful for a woman to shoot. That was a man's business, you see. It was uphill work, for when I began, there was a prejudice to live down. Annie Oakley, 1917. When it comes to the ideal of the strong, independent woman of the West, no character in history seems to fit the image better than a little sure shot, the champion sharpshooter, Annie Oakley. It didn't matter that she wasn't from the West and never lived west of the Mississippi. Nonetheless, she was the Westerner. She embodied all those traits that the people like to think belonged to a Western woman. Phoebe Ann Moses, later to become the world-famous Annie Oakley, was born in 1860 in the backwoods of Dark County, Ohio. When she was six years old, her father died, and Annie learned to trap and shoot small game just to put food on the family table. I was eight years old when I took my first shot. And I still consider it one of the best shots I ever made, Annie Oakley. She had enough of an eye, enough of a natural sense of aim that she proved to be very proficient. It became important to the family because she became a major provider for the family. But even with Annie's help, her mother couldn't feed four hungry children alone. At the age of 10, Annie was sent to live with a local farmer and his wife. In later years, Annie refused to give the name of the couple who severely abused her for two years. She would only refer to them as the wolves. Her foster parents would beat her and lock her in a dark closet for hours and hours at a time. It's a terrible thing to, to imagine America's sweetheart growing up this way. I think it's one of our great kind of dark secrets of our heritage. They were unusually strict, I gather, uh, cheap, mean. They lied to her. They told her folks, in fact, they told her mother that she didn't want to go home. And they told her that, that her mother didn't want her back. Um, it, was, uh, it was a very unnatural and nasty situation. She was a slave for two years. I think her personality was probably strongly affected by that time. There's a suppressed anger in her for the rest of her life. In 1872, Annie ran away from the wolves and was eventually reunited with her family. To help supplement their income, she began supplying local merchants with fresh game to be shipped to hotels and restaurants in Cincinnati. 
people around town appreciated her skill as a hunter because it was said that there was never any shot in the food that the diners ate when it had come from her because she always made her shots in the head. By the time I had reached 14, I had paid off a mortgage on my father's homestead with money earned from the sale of game and skins. And he also showcased her rifle skills by entering and winning a number of local turkey shoots. Her growing reputation would lead to a fateful meeting with the showman and sharpshooter Frank Butler. Frank Butler was an Irish immigrant who came to this country and uh, worked his way to a uh, place on the American stage. This is at a time in American history when shooting, sports shooting, and competition shooting was very popular, and Butler was good at it. While passing through Ohio, Butler met a man who challenged him to a match with a local unknown. I almost dropped dead when a little slim girl in short dresses stepped out to the mark with me. I was a beaten man the moment she appeared. Right then and there, I decided if I could get that girl, I would do it. Frank Butler, 1924. They shot evenly for 25, for 24 birds, and on the 25th bird, he missed. Uh, but he was a very gracious loser. He, uh, he thanked her for the match, complimented her on her skill, and then courted her for a year. <laughs> There's a charming little girl, she's many miles from here. She's a loving little fairy, you'd fall in love to see her. Her presence would remind you of an angel in the skies. And you better love this little girl with the raindrops in her eyes. Frank Butler, 1881. He was in his 20s when they met. She was 15, and yet within a year, they were married. The story is that Butler's partner, a fellow named Graham, was ill, and she was called up as a member of the audience, and was so obviously good at it, and so charming, and such a novelty to the audience, that Graham was never heard of again. At some time, she adopted the name Oakley as a stage name, and nobody knows why, and uh, Butler and Oakley became a shooting sensation. From that day to this, I have not competed with her in public shooting. She outclassed me. Frank Butler, 1925. He gave up his shooting and everything for her. So he must have thought an awful lot of her. He knew she was better than he was. <laughs> Frank took on the role of business manager for the act and Annie became the star attraction. In the winter of 1884, they happened to be on tour in New Orleans at the same time. Buffalo Bill's Wild West was in town. In the spring of 85, Annie Oakley tried out, sold everyone who saw her very quickly, and within 15 minutes, apparently, had her first contract with the Wild West. From her very first performance with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Annie Oakley was a sensation. She handles a shotgun with an easy familiarity that causes the men to marvel and the women to assume airs of contented superiority. Springfield, Massachusetts, Republican, 1897. She could do miracles with a rifle. It was just incredible. Uh, Frank would stand there with a cigarette in his mouth, and she was a long ways out there. She did out of his mouth, and she never missed. She shot using mirrors. She shot using more than one gun. In some years, she rode bicycles and shot from the, from the back of a bicycle. In some years, she rode horses. She had some sort of magnetism that, uh, that can only come from within. In private, she was quiet and reserved. But in public, she could reach the masses. Among Annie's biggest fans was Chief Sitting Bull. He honored her with an Indian name, meaning Little Sure Shot, and adopted her as one of the Sioux people. One of the things that must have impressed Sitting Bull, that is, her skill at handling a man's weapon. She was a woman who could take care of herself, who was confident of herself and her skills, and yet who was never threatening to the men she was with. When the Wild West went abroad to Europe, little Annie from Ohio became an internationally famous star. All of the performers of the Wild West were invited to give a special performance for the Queen of England. The performers were presented to the prince, Prince Edward, and his wife, Princess Alexandra, 
and Antioch lady marched up and shook Alexander's hand. Instead of walking up and curtsying to the king to be, she shook Alexander's hand. You'll have to excuse me, please, because I'm an American, and in America, ladies come first. Annie Oakley to the Prince of Wales, 1887. There's no question that she was the highest paid performer in the show, aside probably from Buffalo Bill himself. But Annie Oakley stated a few times that she was making as much as five times as much as the Cowboys. She had a reputation for being a tight wife, for being very close with her money. She and Frank banked as much as they could. Annie and Frank toured with other Wild West shows, and she even tried her hand at acting, but they were always loyal to Buffalo Bill. Then in 1903, an item appeared in the national newspapers that would bring out the fighter in America's sweetheart. Annie Oakley, the most famous rifle shot in the world, lies today in a cell at the Harrison Street Station for stealing the trousers of a Negro in order to buy cocaine. Chicago American, August 11th, 1903. Well, of course, it wasn't true. She was so outraged. It so went contrary to her character that she sued against every newspaper that had run that story. Uh, and she won in virtually all of them. I think that below the surface was always a very strong need for her to prove herself a good person, a worthwhile person, a strong person. And when she was challenged on it, that suppressed anger would burst forth. And she took steps to teach them. She was a perfect lady, and Will Rogers, Queen Victoria, all said that they never had seen a more of a lady than she was. There's a photograph of Annie Oakley in the luxurious tent that she lived in when she was traveling with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and she's sitting in the entrance of the tent in a white dress with puffed sleeves, looking very much like the Victorian lady writing a letter. Parked outside of that tent is a bicycle. And that was a symbol of emancipation for the women of her time. It was clear that what that bicycle announced to the world is, I'm a lady, but I get where I want to go when I want to get there. When learning the use of firearms, a woman learns at the same time confidence and self-possession. And are not these qualities of use also in daily life and therefore all the more worthy of cultivation? Annie Oakley, 1894. Annie Oakley was the first white woman to travel with the Wild West show. It wasn't very long, though, before other women joined the shows. As late as the 1890s, the show publicists hadn't figured out what to call them, and we ended up with that decidedly ungraceful word cowgirl for them. Um, but, um, but she did pave the way for them. Annie Oakley helped them to develop a different kind of consciousness, a consciousness of the ability of women to compete with men and especially perhaps an economic consciousness, a realization that if they did that, they could earn the same as men. My reputation as a writer and a quick shot was well known, for the toll gatherers looked on me as a good fellow, and they knew I never missed my mark. Calamity Jane, 1896. As newly independent Western women, Annie Oakley, Calamity Jane and Belle Starr were more than just legends. They, along with the thousands of lesser-known ladies who left us with only their letters and diaries to remember them by, helped open up a frontier that would change the direction of American womanhood forever. After all the trials and hardships that had been our lot while journeying through the wilderness, I would not exchange my life for the wear and tear of the fashionable society woman who must fulfill her social obligations with no fruit to show as a result of her hard labor. Phoebe Goodall Judson, 1852. For a woman to take on a man's job, the assumption is she'll do it for the duration. She'll take it on just till we can get to Oregon or just till we can get where we're going and then she'll revert to form. Whether they did or not is another matter. This year I set out to prove that a woman could ranch if she wanted to. I have tried every kind of work this ranch affords, and I can do any of it. Eleanor Pruitt Stewart, Wyoming Homesteader, 1909. I think a dozen western states 
gave the vote to women before the first Eastern State did. So there's some very real gains, politically and socially, for women in the West. They first served on juries in the West. They didn't face the older established structures and institutions that were predominant on the East Coast. The West was fluid and dynamic. And it was the kind of environment, therefore, that great, gave great opportunity uh, to, to men and, and women alike. I think the reason that women in the West uh, first threw off the shackles of uh, the system uh, was because they had to. Uh, they had to fight for survival. Out there alone, they suddenly realized that for the first time in their lives, they were free. It was going to be rough. They could do what they damn pleased. They didn't have to ask a male, can I do this? They had, they had to do it. Any woman who can stand her own company can see the beauty of a sunset and is willing to put in as much time and careful labor as she does over the wash tubs. will certainly succeed, will have independence and a home of her own in the end. Eleanor Pruitt Stewart, 1909. When women went west, there was no way for them to have imagined the hardships and challenges they had encountered. It's a tribute to their underlying strength and spirit that they not only rose to meet those challenges, but at the same time overcame the customs that defined them as the weaker sex. These extraordinary women were trailblazers in every sense of the term. Popular myth has a tendency to focus on what the men of the West were, leaving the impression that women were just their servants. No doubt, when the first wagon trains left, some women were reluctant to leave their comfortable homes for the almost certain hardships of the trail. But undoubtedly, the same was true for some men. The reality was, it didn't take long for Western fever to infect everyone with the same lust for adventure and freedom. My husband was fired with patriotism, and I was possessed with a spirit of adventure and a desire to see what was new and strange. We had become indifferent to fear, and we felt sure we could go almost anywhere. Miriam Thompson Tuller, emigrate to Oregon, 1845. 
The women in the West uh, were just like the men, entrepreneurial, courageous, bold, adventurous, intelligent. The West really selected and filtered people. The women had to be all those things the men were in spades because they were doing all the same things the men were doing and lacking the same degree of physical prowess uh, that the men had. And the women in the West were the very uh, best that America had to offer. In an era when the ideal notion for womanhood was all ruffles and domesticity, the Migration West created challenging new roles for women that only the courageous dared to fill. While writers and artists were romanticizing the West as a man's frontier, pioneer women were busy making their own version of history. In reading the diaries of women who went West, you find uh, women who looked upon this as a great adventure of their lives, that many other women are not going to experience this and that we should appreciate it even though it's uncomfortable. Nearly everybody had what was called the gold fever, my husband with the rest. I said, we were married to live together, he's saying yes, and I am willing to go with you to any part of God's footstool where you think you can do the best. And so it was settled that we should go next year to the California gold mines. Mary Jane Hayden, 1849. There's an indication that only 10% of the people going west in the gold rush days of 49 uh, were women. Only one out of 10 were women. Within 10 years, they, it was about half and half because women knew the men weren't going to come back for a long time, and the men knew they weren't coming back. They wanted the women to go with them. The west in the early days was an area of single men. There were soldiers, there were cowboys, there were miners. The idea was if you wanted to find a husband, you could go to a place where there was a male surplus. So for some women, it was a chance to have a better, a better chance on the marriage market. For other women, there were entrepreneurial opportunities, business opportunities, and some people simply were dragged kicking and screaming out to the West, and once they got here, many hated it and others loved it. The long-suffering pioneer wife sitting passively under a sunbonnet upon her husband's wagon was a common stereotype. But the frontier called out to women from all races, classes, and creed. We have to remember that there was a, a, a variation of women who went west. Most of them, of course, went with their husbands, but you had very uh, well-educated wives of officers in the army. You had women who were going to be nurses. They might be going out there to help educate the Indians. And then you had the uh, adventurous woman, uh, the fancy woman, the Galago cat, who went out to make a fortune. So you can't pin down a Western woman as being a sun-bonneted wife sitting on a covered wagon heading west. The myth of the woman sitting on the buckboard of the covered wagon is just that, because they walked. You walk to save the animals, you walk because you're trying to carry your stuff. But all along the way, they're gathering dried buffalo chips to use for fuel, and then you have to convince your family that the food tastes good once you're cooking with buffalo. Dumb. It rains and snows. I carry my babe and lead, or rather carry another, through snow, mud, and water almost to my knees. It is the worst road. Sometimes I had to place my babe on the ground and help to keep the wagon from turning over. Elizabeth Smith Gear, 1847. Imagine having to take your kitchen on the road, having to uh, take care of your children on the road, having to make shelter. They had to clean, they had to wash clothes, they had to uh, prepare food, uh, take care of the children. It was a, a 24 hour day. Women also faced another special hardship on the trail. About one out of every five who made the overland journey was pregnant. All too often, pioneer mothers had to watch their children die. The mothers had the families directly in their hands and were with them all the time, especially during sickness. I remember distinctly one girl in particular, about my own age, that died and was buried on the road. Her mother had a great deal of trouble and suffering. It strikes me as I think of it now that mothers on the road had to undergo more trial and suffering than anybody else. Martha Ann Morrison, 1844. The losses of loved ones, the injuries uh, suffered in these treks, the daily routine often was a monumental task just to survive. The Trans-Mississippi West is really our Homeric epic. 
It's our era of heroes, um, male and female. Being forced to conquer these hardships of daily life gave women newly found confidence and a taste of independence that they weren't in a hurry to give up as the end of the trail drew near. Women's roles had been established for centuries as to what part they played in. This was going to change. This was going to change in the West. The West was a new world where old rules and customs could be reshaped or just tossed to the wind. Some daring and clever women saw the new frontier as a chance to break free of the traditional roles that had held them back for so long. I was considered a remarkable good shot and a fearless rider for a girl of my age. I was christened Calamity Jane. Martha Canary Burke, 1896. Who was Calamity Jane is one of your uh, five million dollar questions in Western history and Western women's history. That's you.